everyone. Thank you for joining us on this sunny day. Well, in Boston, it's sunny at least. I'm Lynn Krasker Schultz, and I am the Director of Programming and Community Outreach for the Vilna Schultz Boston Center for Jewish Culture. I would like to extend our sincere thanks and gratitude to the Falmouth Jewish Congregation and the Worcester JCC, who are our partners on today's program and many other programs throughout the past year. The silver lining of this pandemic is that we have been able to partner with new organizations to create unique programs, such as the one you're about to experience. You are among over 500 people registered for this one particular program. For those that are unfamiliar with the Vilna, the Vilna was built in 1919 during the middle of the Spanish flu pandemic. Today, we focus on bringing people together to build community and experience Jewish culture through various modalities, art, film, history, literature, cooking, adult learning, and so much more. On June 8th, we welcome you to join us virtually for our first ever Moth Hour. It's an evening of stories about the Vilna from the past, present, and what we predict for the future. Think of us as the JCC or a 92nd Street Y located in historic Beacon Hill, a central hub of activity, all while brimming with history. In a moment, we will paste a survey into the chat box. We ask that you please take a moment either during or after this program to let us know what you thought. It's really important for us to hear from our audience, their thoughts and feedback so that we can continue to improve and offer engaging and wonderful programs. Now for some housekeeping. In just a moment, I will hand the virtual mic over to our featured speaker. We'll paste Jonathan Kaufman's full bio in the chat momentarily. Jonathan will talk for about 40 minutes and then Nancy Greenberg from the Worcester JCC will take your questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A box in your Zoom taskbar, not into the chat box. And now without further ado, I hand our virtual microphone over to Jonathan Kaufman. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for, uh, for joining this afternoon. Um, it, it's really great to share these stories with so many people who are interested. I, I sometimes joke that I feel like I'm living under a Yiddish curse, which is may your book come out during a pandemic when all the bookstores are closed. Um, and, uh, and happily, um, you know, this is a chance to connect with people who are interested in these stories um, and to talk a little bit about the journey that, um, that uh, brought me to them. Um, I, I thought I would start out by talking a little bit about um, how I got interested in this topic um, of, of the Jews in Shanghai and these two remarkable families. Um, basically, this all started back in the late 1970s when I was a young foreign correspondent uh, first covering China. And I was in Shanghai uh, doing some reporting, and I was walking along the Bun, that famous Art Deco uh, waterfront area, um, with the Art Deco skyscrapers. Uh, and I had to use the bathroom. And so I walked into a hotel and it was like walking into a movie set from the 1930s. Now you have to remember China in the late 1970s was still red China. Um, everything was gray. Um, everybody was wearing those Mao suits that we remember. <clears throat> there were far more bicycles than cars. But suddenly when I went into this hotel, it was like walking into a movie set. Um, the, there were beautiful marble floors, uh, chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, etched stained glass windows, and then a, a bellhop all dressed in white with a small little white hat came up to me. And when I, when I asked him in English where the bathroom was, he responded to me in French. And so I, I left that hotel trying to figure out what was this artifact doing, this, this blast from the past doing in the middle of communist China. And someone told me that the hotel had been built by Victor Sassoon, who was a playboy millionaire, um, Jewish, who had lived in Shanghai in the 1920s and the 1930s. So as reporters often do, I kind of file that away um, in my mind. And then a few years later, I was back in Shanghai again, and um, somebody invited me to go see what they called the Children's Palace. Children's Palace was where uh, Chinese folks in Shanghai would bring their kids on weekends. Um, they would uh, bring them there for ballet lessons or music lessons. So I thought it might be a nice feature story. I was a reporter and I wanted to kind of write about, you know, the, the ad different aspects of Chinese life. So I went to this children's palace, but again, it was completely incongruous. It was, it was a huge English style country house in the middle of Shanghai, surrounded by manicured lawns. It frankly looked like it belonged more in Downton Abbey um, than in the middle of, of communist China. 
um, I, I went up the stairs, I went inside, and there were lots of Chinese kids taking lessons and studying music and practicing the cello. But the rooms were these grand rooms, a huge ballroom as big as a football field, uh, these sweeping staircases that went up to the, the second floor. Um, clearly a family of immense wealth had once lived here. And as I left, I noticed there was a small plaque um, by the entrance uh, to the building, um, which said that this had once been the home to the Kaduri family. Well, I knew the Kaduris because I was living in Hong Kong at the time, and the Kaduris were one of the wealthiest families in Hong Kong, one of the most powerful, a, a very prominent Jewish family um, that was very influential. Um, uh, I knew of their power in Hong Kong, but I hadn't realized um, that they too had lived in Shanghai in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, and then uh, I moved to China as a foreign correspondent. I worked for the Wall Street Journal and I was the Beijing bureau chief. And I moved there with my family. Uh, we had three little kids at the time and um, they loved Shanghai. You know, We loved going down there as a family. The kids enjoyed exploring it. And so one weekend we were exploring some of the back alleys of, uh, of Shanghai. And um, I noticed on the doorposts of many of the tenement houses in this one neighborhood, there were the shadows of mezuzahs, not mezuzahs themselves, but the nail holes and the shadows where they once had been. And again, I was trying to figure out what, what were mezuzahs doing in Shanghai? And of course, as it turned out, um, these were mezuzahs that had been put up by some of the 18,000 Jewish refugees who had fled Vienna and Berlin uh, and the Nazis and found refuge in China during the Second World War. <clears throat> so all of these kind of moments gathered and I decided, as all journalists do at some point, I wanted to find out what was really going on. <clears throat> and so I began to look into this history. Now, a lot of us, when we think about Jewish history and the klezmer music at the start of the program captures that, you know, we think of Europe, we think of Fiddler on the Roof, we think of the, you know, familiar and important story of Jews who grew up in shtetls um, or in ghettos of Europe, and then kind of made their way up through society or, or, or made their way um, to the United States. Um, but the story of these two families is very different, and it starts in Baghdad. Um, we read about Baghdad in the Bible. Baghdad is actually Babylon. And for those of you who remember your Bible, uh, we recite the Psalm, which says, by the rivers of Babylon, we wept when we remembered Zion. Um, the Baghdadi Jews were Jews who had been kidnapped um, by Nebuchadnezzar after the destruction of the temple and brought in captivity to Baghdad, which, which the Bible refers to as Babylon. And while they may well have wept by the waters of Babylon when they remembered Jerusalem, uh, they also did extremely well uh, in Baghdad. Um, they very quickly became uh, very wealthy and influential um, citizens. Um, they were very involved in trade uh, in various aspects of the economy. Um, they also established uh, great centers of Jewish learning. And in fact, the Jews were so prominent in Baghdad um, that the, the rulers of Baghdad, whether it was the, the, the Turks, the Ottomans, various Pashas, would name one prominent Jewish family, the wealthiest Jewish family, to serve as kind of a, unofficial advisors, almost like the secretary of the treasury, who they would consult on economic matters, trade matters, and so forth. Um, and in fact, when um, the leader of this family uh, would go to meet with the Pasha, he'd be carried in a sedan chair through the streets of Baghdad. And everyone in Baghdad, Jew or Gentile alike, would tip their head in reverence as the sedan chair passed by. In such high esteem were these families held. Um, the Sassoons were that family. Um, they were the most prominent family in Baghdad. <clears throat> they were extremely wealthy um, and extremely influential. But as often happens in Jewish history, politics turned against the Jews at one point. Um, and uh, in the early 1800s, it suddenly became very dangerous uh, to be Jewish in Baghdad. And David Sassoon, um, who was 37 years old, was about to take over this great dynasty, was about to be the man carried on the sedan chair um, throughout the city. Instead, he was arrested um, by the Turkish rulers and uh, put in prison and uh, was being held for ransom. His father rushed down to the jail, ransomed his son out, but realized that things were not gonna go well for the Jews going forward. 
And so he took his son to the um, waterfront, uh, put him on a small boat that he had uh, bought and set sail, let him set sail um, to, leave, uh, to leave Baghdad. But before he left, he draped a cloak over his shoulders and in the, 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 the lining of the coat, he had sewed pearls and precious gems. So David Sassoon would have a start when he um, washed up on whatever shore that, that he was headed for. Um, David Sassoon ended up landing first in India. Uh, and he landed in India just as the British Empire was moving into India and about to turn India into a colony. Um, and the, the British in conquering India realized that, you know, to, to really succeed, to really spread the empire everywhere, they needed people, including immigrants, including Jews, to kind of carry the Union Jack and to do business under the Union Jack. And so David Sassoon, even though he had been forced to flee Baghdad, um, was still had all the kind of, you know, the smarts and the business sense and the experience to try to rebuild his fortune. And in some ways, when I, I think about this story, it, it's almost Shakespearean. It's, it's really a, a family that was virtually royalty um, that lost everything and then spent the next century or so trying to rebuild their fortune and regain their influence. Um, David Sassoon turned out to be a very successful businessman in India. Um, he was able to um, quickly parlay his business sense, his knowledge of languages into great success. He became a millionaire very quickly and was able to get his family out of Baghdad, um, his wife, his children, even his father, and settle, um, settle in Bombay. And in Bombay, he realized that one of the best businesses to be in was opium. Um, now, the story of opium is something I'll return to in a little bit because it raises all sorts of kind of difficult moral issues. Um, but um, opium was legal in India, it was grown in India, and uh, China was potentially a huge market for opium. About 12% of Chinese were addicted to opium, even though the Chinese empire made opium illegal and tried to combat all the efforts of British companies to smuggle opium inside. But there was so much money to be made in opium that the British companies persuaded the British government to invade China uh, and force China to open up itself to trade. This hope and myth of the China market, you know, millions of people who might buy Western products was true uh, even then in the 1830s and 1840s. And so the British government invaded China twice um, they defeated China. And as a result of that, China was forced to open up um, most of its major ports, including Hong Kong and Shanghai, um, to British, American, um, all sorts of Western traders. Um, and they had to open up to opium. Now, um, at this point, David Sassoon decided that opium was probably the best business for someone trying to build a global dynasty to be in. Um, he had become an Anglophile. Um, he very much believed in the British Empire. Um, and while he himself never learned English, he made sure that all eight of his sons uh, learned English. They became citizens of Britain. And in fact, when Queen Victoria came to power, David Sassoon made all his sons join him uh, on the waterfront in Bombay and um, declare their allegiance to Queen Victoria and in their broken English sing God save the queen. So David Sassoon believed that China then was the future. The British had opened up China to trade and he was going to take advantage of it. Now, as I mentioned, he had eight sons and these became in a sense, his, his kind of not only his, his children but they were his business partners. He sent all of them across China to establish offices and to begin trading. Um, most of them were very young and because this was in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, they would often be away from their families for years at a time while they started the business in China. And very quickly, the Sassoons were successful in the opium business. And they were successful in part because they were more innovative and entrepreneurial than anyone else. I sometimes think of China around this time as being like the Silicon Valley of its day where you know, ambitious young men, and they were, they were always young men, could make a lot of money very, very quickly. Um, the Sassoons uh, really succeeded because of two things. One was they decided to invest in steamships. The opium had traditionally been taken from India up to China 
um, on, uh, on sailing ships, which took several weeks to make the journey. But the Sassoons invested in steamships, which were still very new, which allowed them to cut the travel time uh, down to a matter of days and allowed them to get their opium to market in China a lot faster than their competitors. Um, they also invested in this new technology called the telegraph. The telegraph enabled the brothers who were in China to communicate with their father who was in India and let each other know about the prices of products, whether now is a good time to sell, to kind of stay one step ahead from uh, all of their competitors. And through these innovations um, and, um, and business sense, the Sassoons were essentially able to take over the opium trade completely. They drove out their British rivals and they completely dominated the opium trade. And when I was researching the book, one of the things that was so interesting was to see the business records of their British competitors, many of whom were very well connected in London. And the British were complaining all the time, like, who are these, who are these Jews? Who are these hook-nosed Jews, these immigrants from Baghdad who are taking away all our business, undercutting our prices? Um, and so even while there was great business success for the Sassoons, there was this foreshadowing of anti-Semitism, which would pursue them uh, throughout, their, throughout their business careers. Um, now, um, the Sassoons were so successful um, in the opium trade. In 1949, when the communists invaded, took over China and moved into Shanghai, they seized the Sassoon business records. And they concluded, and I was able to see these records as well, they concluded that the Sassoons made about a billion dollars, that's B for billion, um, in, uh, in the opium trade, and then using that money to invest in factories and real estate and so forth. Um, and it, it, you know, it, 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 it was really an extraordinary fortune. Now, when I talk to the Sassoon descendants today about opium, they basically say, well, you know, it, it was sort of like cigarettes or it's like alcohol. Um, these were, this was a product that was a vice. People were buying it. Um, we were kind of fulfilling a business need. Um, there's an element of truth to that. Opium was legal. In fact, one way the Sassoons gained influence in London was that they became very close to the Prince of Wales and members of the British aristocracy and would give them opportunities to buy opium stock, stock in opium, which they could then sell later when the, when the drug was being sold in, in Shanghai. So it, this was kind of an open trade that everybody could participate in. But it's also true that the Sassoons knew how dangerous opium was. As I say, about 12% of Chinese citizens uh, were addicted to opium. Just to give you a sense of comparison, um, about 2% of Americans are addicted to opioid drugs. And we know the kind of heartbreak and anger that has created. Um, <coughs> imagine six times as many people um, being addicted to opium. Uh, even the Sassoon's own employees, their own Chinese employees uh, would sometimes get addicted to opium and the Sassoon's would have to fire them because they had become useless working. Um, the Sassoon's themselves never used opium. Um, and they also used their increasing influence in England um, to fight against any efforts to ban the opium trade. There were all sorts of campaigns made um, to abolish the opium trade. Um, but the Sassoon's who were rising in political power in England because they were so wealthy and were so important to the British trade continually fought against it. Um, so, you know, there's a famous line, I think it's in Balzac, who says that uh, behind every great fortune lies a crime. And for the Sassoons, the crime, the crime was, the crime was opium. Um, as I mentioned, um, part of the Sassoon's success was that they became very influential in London. Um, David Sassoon, once his eight sons had established the beachhead for the dynasty in Shanghai, began to send them to England. Um, with instructions to buy country houses there, to enroll their children in British boarding schools in Eton, um, to go to universities like Cambridge and Oxford, and also to become friends with the British aristocracy. And so um, as, the, uh, as the brothers became older, they became very prominent uh, on the British social scene. They would hold grand parties, they would entertain members of the British aristocracy, um, and did become very close to the Prince of Wales, um, uh, Prince uh, uh, Queen Victoria's son, uh, who would eventually become King Edward. 
And in fact, they were so prominent um, that this created a kind of backbiting and social anti-Semitism. Um, they would have these parties and they would write back to um, their relatives in Bombay about what a success it was and the Prince of Wales stayed until three in the morning and, and so forth. But then the British aristocrats would be writing in their diaries, I would never rent my home to these Jews. You know, who do they think they are? In fact, Winston Churchill, um, who became friendly with many of the Sassoons, uh, when King Edward uh, took the throne after Queen Victoria died, um, he wrote to someone saying, I wonder if he's going to move into Buckingham Palace and take all his Jews with him. So um, the Sassoons were both extremely prominent in England, very influential, but there was always this kind of social anti-Semitism um, that, um, that they faced no matter where they, where they went. Um, I want to talk a little at this point about the women in this story because, you know, women in history, especially when we look back in the 19th century or early 20th century, it's hard to find out very much about women because they, they didn't keep the kind of records that men did. People didn't pay as much attention to them, frankly. Um, but the women in these families are remarkable um, and I think in many ways played the role of being the conscience um, of, of both these families. Um, as I'd mentioned, the Sassoon brothers increasingly were settling in London and they were living the high life. Um, they were buying estates, they were having grand parties. Um, and because of that, there was growing concern about who was going to run the business in India and China, which was producing all the money, producing all the profits. And at one point, uh, one of the Sassoon brothers who had remained in India died unexpectedly. He died quite young. And the family was sort of in crisis trying to decide what was going to happen. Um, so his wife, a woman named Flora Sassoon, stepped forward and she said that she would kind of run the company uh, for a few years until their son, who was a teenager, came of age and could then take over. Well, the brothers who were in London thought that was a fine idea. I mean, it was just a woman after all. Um, they thought she'd be a puppet, a figurehead. They would still make all the decisions and they could control her um, until uh, her son came of age and the men kind of took over again. Um, but it turned out they really underestimated Flora Sassoon. Um, she was a brilliant woman. She had learned many languages. Um, she was extremely smart. And um, she began to run the company uh, in the late 1890s. And this was at a time when not only women didn't have the vote, women in India couldn't even be seen in public. They lived behind what was called purda, which meant that they couldn't be seen in, in, in public. And um, so Flora Sassoon initially was running this huge global empire from her living room. But gradually, in, in, in steps that really scandalized people, she began to go to the Sassoon offices around India. Um, she visited factories. Um, and she turned out to be a, a very effective businesswoman. In fact, in a moment, kind of much like the one that we're living through now, a plague broke out in Bombay, the bubonic plague. And because of it, the workers at all the Sassoon factories, thousands of workers, refused to go to work because they were afraid of catching the plague. And so Flora Sassoon decided to sponsor scientists from Europe to come to India to hunt for a vaccine. They found a vaccine. And then Flora Sassoon insisted that she be given the vaccine and that a picture be taken of her with her bare arm showing getting the vaccine so her workers would know that it was safe, that if the head of the company, this woman was prepared to take the vaccine, they should take it too and come back to work. Um, and that in many ways really saved um, the Sassoon business to weather that crisis. Um, and as Flora became more and more effective um, in her strategies and running the, the company, her, brother -in -law, her brothers-in-law became more and more concerned. Um, and they essentially got together in London and ousted her in a boardroom coup. Um, they uh, uh, kicked her out of the company. Um, she eventually sailed to London where she became a very well-known philanthropist and um, a hostess, but she never set foot in the Sassoon businesses again. As a friend of mine said, she'd hit the bamboo ceiling. Um, another woman who I think was, was equally remarkable in her own way is Laura Kaduri. Now, as I mentioned, um, going to China was very much a young man's game. 
And the Sassoons, as their empire expanded in China, realized that they needed more young people they could trust to run these various offices they were opening. So they sent word back to Baghdad, to Jewish families in Baghdad, that if you send your sons to work for the Sassoons in China, in India, uh, the Sassoons set up schools where they would educate them. Uh, they would train them to be clerks and teach them accounting skills. They set up a Jewish hospital. So if they got sick, they would get care. Um, and they set up a cemetery so that if they died, um, there would be a place where they could be buried either in India or in China. The Kaduri's, uh, the Kaduri family um, was related to the Sassoons quite distantly. They weren't nearly as wealthy, um, but um, they, uh, they faced a crisis when their father died um, and Rena Sassoon was left with seven children. And so she decided to send um, some of her boys to work for the Sassoons. And one of them was Eli Kaduri. Eli Kaduri was 15 years old when he was sent away from Baghdad by his mother to work for the Sassoons in Bombay. He was 18 years old when he arrived in China. Now imagine what it must have been like. You're 18 years old, you're arriving in China, you don't speak a word of Chinese. And China back then in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s was not the China of today. There was civil war, there was terrible disease, starvation. It was an incredibly difficult place to operate, incredibly lonely, incredibly isolated. But Eli Kaduri recognized that there was also an enormous opportunity to make money. And he quickly left the Sassoons and struck out on his own um, and began investing in businesses in Shanghai and in Hong Kong. And by the, time, by the time he was 30, he had become a millionaire. And at that point, he decided it was time to find a wife. And so he set sail for London, hoping to find a wife there. Um, and he was introduced to a very influential, rich, a Jewish British family, the Mokadas, um, who were part of kind of, we could call it the British Jewish aristocracy. And he fell in love with their daughter, Laura. Now um, they got married and typically what would happen at that point would be that Laura would get pregnant and Ellie would sail back to China, you know, continue to make money, come home maybe a couple of times a year um, and they would live these kind of separate lives. Um, but Laura was very unusual. She was quite adventurous. She was actually older than Ellie and, and many in her family had begun to worry that she would be a spinster, that she would never marry, that she was too independent. Um, and after they got married, she announced that she intended not to stay in London, but to go back to China um, with her new husband. And so the two of them, Ellie and Laura, set sail for Hong Kong. Um, very quickly, Laura had uh, two children, two boys. And then she announced that she was going to accompany her husband as he traveled around China doing his business deals. Um, even more remarkable for my part, uh, she kept a diary, um, which reads almost like Catherine Hepburn and the African Queen. I mean, she's traveling with her husband. Admittedly, she's traveling with servants. But, you know, they're seeing civil war break out. They're seeing gunships. They're seeing the incredible poverty um, that existed in China at the time. And one of the things Laura began to believe was that if China was ever able to recover, if it was ever able to get out of the terrible poverty that it faced, it had to educate girls, it had to educate women. Now this is remarkable. Remember, this is in like the early 1900s. Um, and, but she convinced her husband to start funding and supporting um, girl, uh, schools for Chinese girls. Um, and uh, the Kaduris began to open these. Um, and I, I think in some ways, she became the conscience of the family and had a much more of an intimate relationship with ordinary Chinese than her husband, who was just off making uh, business deals and money all the time. Uh, the Kaduri settled in Shanghai. Um, and at one point, a fire broke out um, in their home. And Laura Kaduri ran out. Um, but she was convinced that the Chinese governess, the Chinese servant she had hired to take care of her boys was still trapped inside in the fire. So she ran back into the house. As it turned out, the Chinese governess had escaped through another door. Um, Laura became disoriented by the fire. She lost her way. She was overcome by smoke and she died. Now, this was obviously an incredible tragedy for the Kaduri family. Um, but it was also a story that the Chinese uh, told each other and still talk about today. This idea that a, 
a wealthy British woman would run into a burning building to save a Chinese servant was something the Chinese you know, couldn't comprehend. This was not the way you know, British colonialists, British imperialists acted. And as I say, I, I think Laura's life and the way she died really had a profound impact on the Kaduri family um, and shaped in many ways um, a lot of the philanthropy and the good things that they did um, in the decades, um, in the decades that followed. Um, I'm going to jump ahead now to the 1920s and 1930s, because if a, a movie is ever made of this book, that's the time that the movie is going to focus on, and Victor Sassoon is the person um, who's going to star in the movie. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the, the Sassoons had really established um, a very good lifestyle for themselves in London. Um, they were living the grand life, they were palling around with royalty, and Victor Sassoon enjoyed all of it. Um, he was born uh, in Europe, um, and he was very handsome, very athletic, um, and went to Cambridge University. And even at Cambridge University, uh, he was always seen with a chorus girl on each arm. Uh, he was considered to have one of the best wine cellars um, in all of London, even when he was a, a college student. Um, and he was clearly one of the Sassoons, one of the Playboy Sassoons, that people thought would be very good at spending money but not very good at making it. Um, but during World War I, he became a pilot and his plane crashed and he became crippled. He uh, injured his legs and uh, lost the use of his legs, had to use a cane and a wheelchair to get around. And he fell into a depression and basically was convinced he would never be able to enjoy the kind of grand life that he had begun to enjoy in, in England with all his money. Um, and so instead he decided to go to India and China um, to see what the business was like. Um, and he turned out again to be a, a brilliant businessman. Um, he moved the entire operation of the Sassoon family to Shanghai, and he built that wonderful hotel um, where I first uh, uh, went to use the bathroom many decades later, and began to um, build buildings that reshaped the Shanghai skyline, um, factories, um, and quickly became the richest man in Shanghai. But he wasn't only the richest man, he was also the man having the most fun. Um, Victor Sassoon essentially took Shanghai and turned it into one of the most remarkable cities in the world. You know, right now, as the pandemic is ending, we're all talking about where is our first trip going to be? Where are we going to go? What place are we dying to see? And if this were 1930, we'd all be talking about Shanghai. Um, Shanghai had become the sixth largest city in the world. It was exotic, it was strange, and Victor Sassoon made it luxurious. Uh, Charlie Chaplin went to Shanghai to visit Victor Sassoon. Uh, Noel Coward wrote Private Lives in a, in a suite at Victor Sassoon's hotel. Uh, Wallace Simpson, who would make the King of England leave his throne, was photographed in Shanghai, um, completely naked, wearing only a life jacket which gives you a sense of what some of the appeal of Shanghai was. It was, it was exotic, but it was also very naughty. In fact, when I, was, um, when I was doing the research for the book, I went to the cafe hotel where Victor Sassoon had built the, a sort of a penthouse for himself at the very top uh, of the hotel where he lived overlooking his kind of Shanghai empire. And as I was going through um, his, uh, his apartment there, um, I went into the bathroom, which was very luxurious. There were two bathtubs. And I said to the Chinese fellow who was taking me around, I said, why are there two bathtubs? And he kind of blushed and he said, well, he said, Victor Sassoon always said he didn't mind sharing his bed, but he didn't like sharing his bath. So that gives you an idea of what it was like to be Victor Sassoon uh, in Shanghai in the 1920s and 1930s. He would have these extraordinary parties um, where he would dress up as a ringmaster and everyone else had to dress up as circus acts. He would dress up as a schoolmaster and everyone had to dress up as children. I mean, he really made Shanghai kind of a place you would want to go on your, on your, grand, on your grand tour. Um, but starting in the late 1930s, um, the people coming on these cruise ships to Shanghai from Europe uh, stop being celebrities and they start being desperate Jewish refugees. By 1937, 38, um, the Nazis had taken over in Germany. Um, they had uh, invaded and taken over Austria. Um, Kristallnacht was on the horizon. 
And Jews in Germany and, and Austria were in a panic um, to leave Europe, to find some place where they would be safe. And as we know, every country shut their doors to these Jewish refugees. The US wouldn't let them in, Great Britain wouldn't let them in, there was no place for them to go. Except as it turned out, there was Shanghai. Because Shanghai was in part occupied by the British, in part by the French, in part by the Japanese, no one really ran the city. If you could make it to Shanghai, you didn't need a visa or anything. If you could make it to Shanghai, you would be safe, you would be let in. And so word spread among uh, the desperate Jews of, of Germany and, uh, and Austria that if they made it to Shanghai, um, they had a chance to survive. And so tens of thousands of Jews um, begin to sell all their belongings. These are mostly middle-class Jews, um, lawyers, doctors, professionals, uh, storekeepers, musicians, um, so selling their belongings and buying a passage on these cruise ships that usually left from Italy and then uh, arrived in Shanghai. Now, the pictures are remarkable and you can imagine what it must have been like. I mean, these are families that at one moment had been in Vienna and Berlin, very prosperous, going to the opera, living you know, middle-class lives, suddenly are arriving in Shanghai where there's desperate poverty. No one speaks English, no one speaks German, they don't speak Chinese. And they're disembarking into this chaotic city where there are literally Chinese dying in the street. Um, at this point, the Kadoris and the Sassoons really have what I think is, I would guess I would call their Schindler moment. Um, they decide that they're going to help these refugees, um, even though they know nothing about refugee work. They're just very successful businessmen. Um, but they really step forward. Um, Victor Sassoon uh, turns many of his um, buildings, um, uh, the bottom floors into dormitories, into soup kitchens to help these refugees. He turns over many of his properties so they can live there. He hires many of them. Uh, Eli Kaduri's sons, Horace and, and Lawrence, uh, Horace sets up a school for these refugee children and hires teachers who are fleeing Berlin and Vienna to teach the children and give them some kind of, of, uh, of stability. Um, and many of the refugees who survived, including people like Lawrence Tribe, the Harvard Law professor, um, and others, went to this Kaduri school, and that's how they um, were able to keep up their education um, during the war in Shanghai. Even more remarkable, Victor Sassoon kind of goes to extraordinary lengths to keep the doors open, to allow these Jews to keep on arriving in Shanghai. Because at this point, the Japanese are closing in on Shanghai. The Japanese had invaded China uh, uh, earlier in the 1930s. By 1937, they had encircled the city. They hadn't taken it over yet because they didn't want to uh, provoke um, uh, America's entry into the war or Britain's entry into the war. But the noose was clearly tightening. And they saw all these Jews arriving. They were allied with the Nazis. And so they appointed a Japanese captain, a man named Inazuka, um, to be in charge of what they called the Jewish problem. And um, Inazuka uh, identified Victor Sassoon as being the most powerful man in town and began to meet with him. And Victor Sassoon could be charming. And he charmed Inazuka. He said, please, you know, you can, you can come to my nightclub anytime you want. Your officers can eat there. Uh, make yourself at home. And at the same time, he was having his waiters and bartenders spy on the Japanese officers to find out what they were talking about. Um, he would say to the, to the Japanese, I'll speak to Churchill. I'll see what I can do about keeping Britain out of the war. And then he would fly to South America to see if he could buy land um, where the Jewish refugees might be able to resettle. Um, it was really an extraordinary con game um, that Victor Sassoon did to keep the gates open as long as he could. And ultimately 18,000 Jewish refugees um, were able to find sanctuary in Shanghai because of his efforts and the efforts of many of the other wealthy Jews who had settled in, in Shanghai. Um, the Japanese caught on to Victor Sassoon. He had to flee the country. Uh, right before Pearl Harbor. The Kaduris were not as lucky. They stayed too long uh, and they were imprisoned by the Japanese. And Eli Kaduri actually died uh, in ja under Japanese imprisonment um, during World War II in Shanghai. Um, when the war ended uh, and the Americans liberated the city, 
they couldn't believe that here was an entire community of 18,000 Jews. And even though Japan was allied with the Nazis, all of them had survived the war. The Nazis, in fact, had sent members of the Gestapo to Shanghai and tried to persuade the Japanese to solve their uh, Jewish problem by loading all these Jews onto barges and then sinking them uh, in, the, uh, in the river. But the Japanese refused in part because they believed that perhaps you know, Victor Sassoon was right and these Jews could be a, a valuable bargaining chip. Um, and so one of the great miracles of the war is how these refugees uh, managed to survive. When the war was over, Victor Sassoon uh, uh, returned to Shanghai. He thought the parties would continue. He thought it would re they would resume, um, but of course they didn't. Uh, the communists uh, quickly uh, conquered Shanghai. They came to power. Victor Sassoon had to flee. Um, he got a return ticket, but he never returned to China. And in fact, he lost almost everything because his money was mostly in real estate and the, uh, the, the communists nationalized all of his holdings. Um, he ended up settling in the Bahamas where he became quite bitter and um, basically would say, you know, I didn't leave China, China left me, um, almost like a scorned lover. Um, the Kaduris were smarter in a way um, they had begun moving some of their money out of China, even in the 1930s, to Hong Kong, which was a British colony in which they thought would be safer. Um, and so after the war, um, they moved to Hong Kong and began to rebuild their fortune. And the Kaduris became richer than ever. Um, over the next 50 years, they were deeply involved in Hong Kong's reconstruction. Um, they built the Peninsula Hotel chain. They um, built the power company. Um, and today they are worth $13 billion. They are the richest Western family in China, still headquartered and living in Hong Kong. Um, but like many um, businessmen and others who are living in Hong Kong, they worry about what the future holds. And as we see China now crack down on Hong Kong and become more and more nationalistic, I think the Kaduris worry a little bit, is this Shanghai all over again? And will this wonderful life that they've built for themselves in China uh, uh, come under attack and will they have to flee again? Um, I think I'll stop there because uh, I'm sure folks have questions um, and I'd love to answer um, any questions that you have. Hi, I'm Nancy Greenberg. I'm the Cultural Arts Director at the Worcester JCC. And um, I, there are many questions already in the Q&A box, but please continue to put them in there. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for unveiling this epic story of the Sassoons and the Kadoris and the role they played in the transition of China into a modern industrial society and the global power. So here we go. Um, let me see, let's see. Kelly asked if you could elaborate on the Jewish identities of the Kadoris and the Sassoons and um, how Jewish were they? What role did religion play in their lives? Sure, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And the families are quite different. So when they left Baghdad, they were very Jewish. Um, they were, you know, Orthodox. Um, they kept kosher. They, um, they, they kept, the, the rituals were very important to them. But I think as we know from our own lives, um, when Jews become assimilated and become more and more accepted in Western societies, that begins to fade. Um, it's interesting, the Sassoons, when they got to London, um, had to file their wills in London. And I, I got a chance to see them and they're, they're, they make great reading because you can see the older generation is writing these wills saying that, you know, if you dare marry someone who's not Jewish, if you dare marry someone who's not from Baghdad, you know, you will never get any money. You can almost hear the, the old men thundering through these wills. Um, but of course, many of the Sassoons um, did begin to marry outside the faith. Um, and uh, today, uh, some of the Sassoons moved uh, to Jerusalem and became rabbis and became fairly prominent. But most of them became quite assimilated. Um, and their Jewish identity was important to them, um, certainly culturally, and certainly the British uh, aristocracy was very aware of it. Um, but, um, and Victor Sassoon, I always say, was far more likely to give money to a synagogue than to ever set foot in one. Um, it, it really was something that the religion part they didn't, uh, they didn't um, stay with, but culturally, I think they were very Jewish. 
The Kaduris are different. And part of the reason is the Sassoons were accepted into British society. They were able to become knighted. They became in the House of Lords. Um, they had all the kind of accoutrements of, of, uh, of the British aristocracy. The Kaduris had a harder time. Um, Ellie Kaduri kept on trying to get British citizenship and he kept on being turned down. And in fact, I found a letter from a British consul in Hong Kong who said, if we give him citizenship, we'll have to give it to all of them. Um, so there was clearly a lot of resistance. And because of that, Eli Kaduri became a, quite a fierce Zionist. And so I think the Jewish identity in the Kaduri family is quite strong. Um, these days, they're probably what we would consider reform Jews. Um, they're very influential in the Jewish community in Hong Kong. They give a great deal of money. They show up for the high holidays and they're proud of being Jewish and they talk about it. But in that way, I think both families are much like you know, Michael Bloomberg or, or Jewish executives on Wall Street or in Hollywood. You know, their Jewish identity is important, but it's something that really expresses itself at the high holidays or, you know, on Shabbats occasionally. Um, but they're really best known for being businessmen and politicians and so forth. Thank you. Um, Mona is asking, how did the Sassoon's family uh, opium business fit into the opium wars if it, if it did? Yeah, well, the opium wars were the wars that, that basically um, opened up China to the West. And so the opium wars were really provoked by some British firms, Johnny Matheson and others. Um, the Sassoons at that point weren't rich enough to really participate in the opium trade. But once China opened up, once the opium wars opened up China, that was when the Sassoons were able to move in. So even though Jardine Matheson kind of provoked the wars and, and believed they would profit from it, within 30 or 40 years, they had been driven out by the Sassoons who turned out to be much better businessmen um, than, uh, than Jardine Matheson was. Um, okay. Helen's asking, did the Sassoons and Kadoris experience anti-Semitism in China? You know, it's interesting. When I, um, when I first started going to China looking into this, I met an older Chinese man um, uh, who was in sort of this area where the Jewish refugees had once been. And I was talking to him and I, I asked him if he knew the Sassoons and the Kadoris. And he said, oh yes, everybody knew those names. They were very, very well known. And, um, and I, I said, well, what did you think about them? Because I had just come from reporting in Eastern Europe, um, you know, in Poland, and, and obviously you would have all these kind of fraught conversations with Poles and Germans and others who would talk about what they had or hadn't done during World War II. And so I, I kind of wanted to, to see this question, was there anti-Semitism? And so I said to this man, you know, many people around the world don't like Jewish people. Um, is that something you felt towards these very wealthy Jewish families? And he really thought for a while. And then he said, oh, we hated them, but we hated them because they were British imperialists. Being Jewish had nothing to do with it. And so I, I think in, in, it's interesting, even these days, when you go to China, there's a fascination with Jews. It's one of the few places where, you know, you don't get those kind of <clears throat> uncomfortable conversations about Israel or whatever. Um, I think ordinary Chinese kind of admire Jews. They feel that Jews and Chinese have this connection because, you know, we both love family, education, and so forth. Um, and so I find that when you talk to the Chinese, there is this real interest in, in, in Judaism uh, and in our culture and in our history. Um, was there a Jewish community in Shanghai before World War II and Doris would like to know what happened to the 18,000 Jews uh, who were in Shanghai uh, uh, fleeing from Nazi Germany. Yeah, well, the Jewish community in Shanghai, basically you had the, the, the Kaduris and the Sassoons who were at the very top, very wealthy, prominent Jews. Um, and then there were other Jews who had first come to Shanghai to work for the Sassoons. There was also a group of Jews who came from Russia uh, after the Russian Revolution um, and started there. Um, so, you know, they always say, what is it? You have four Jews, you have five opinions. Even though the Jewish community was relatively small in Shanghai, it was very stratified in terms of, in terms of class. Um, the Jewish refugees, remember, they had not wanted to go to China. It wasn't, they were just desperate to go anywhere and they kind of ended up there. So after World War II, um, uh, most, all of them left. 
In fact, it's quite poignant because the Jews who were in Shanghai, the refugees, had been completely cut off from Europe. They had no idea what was going on in Europe during World War II. And most of them planned to go back. Um, they thought once the war was over, they'd go back to Germany, Vienna, wherever. And uh, when the Americans liberate Shanghai, they begin to put up posters um, that list uh, the towns that have been wiped out and uh, the names of all the Jews who have been killed in all these communities. And there are these haunting photographs of the Jewish refugees looking at these posters and realizing there's nothing to go back to. Their, their homes have been destroyed, their communities have been destroyed. So at that point, the Jewish refugees left. They primarily went to Palestine, to the United States, to Australia, um, to South America. Um, they, they actually, a lot of them remained in touch with each other and there have been reunions of Shanghai Jews, a very strong kind of community. Um, but by the time the communists took over, uh, there were only a handful of Jews left in Shanghai. A couple of questions about um, the, the current situation in Hong Kong and China today. Um, what are the, uh, have the Kadoris adjusted to the current um, crackdown from the mainland and are they staying out of politics? What is going on? Today. No, adjusted is a great word. Um, so it, it's interesting, you know, Eli Kadori, the patriarch, as I say, died under in Japanese captivity. And so his sons, Lawrence and Horace, took over the dynasty after he died. And they moved quickly to Hong Kong because the communists took over Shanghai. And they decided that their father had made a mistake, that he had been a brilliant businessman, but had been isolated. He'd lived in a bubble, this mansion that I described um, where the, the Chinese music lessons were taking place was 43 rooms for three people. And there were 44 servants. I mean, they had lived in this incredible splendor but didn't realize the communists were about to, to destroy it all. And so um, the, the, the Kaduri sons really decided to be much more politically astute. Um, they ended up helping Chinese refugees who were fleeing to Hong Kong um, to really help them. And I think this is in part a legacy of their mother's influence. Um, several hundred thousand refugees were leaving China, fleeing communism, coming into Hong Kong, and they had no way to support themselves. And so the Kaduris began um, setting aside land and paying for um, uh, pigs and for uh, crops so that these uh, farmers could begin to have like small little farms, farm plots, where they could raise some food to feed themselves, but also to sell and kind of get back on their feet in Hong Kong. The Kaduris also funded a tremendous amount of research in kind of more effective pig raising, so to produce bigger pigs that would have more pork, the staple of the Chinese diet. And in fact, the Chinese even today joke that the Kaduris know everything about pig except what it tastes like because they won't, they won't, eat, um, they won't eat pork. Um, so the Kaduris were very clever uh, politically. They never criticized China publicly. And when China opened up again in 1978, Beijing called the Kaduris and invited them back. Uh, the Kaduris were the first big investors in China. They built a nuclear plant. They built hotels. Um, they have huge holdings in China. Um, but because of that, they have to be very careful. They never criticized the Tiananmen massacre in 1989. And today they are basically going along with the crackdown. I mean, they privately have very strong feelings about it, but as businessmen, they feel that they, they need to sort of go along. And I think it's a dilemma that many businesses are facing, whether it's Apple or Volkswagen or Intel. I mean, choose your company. Dealing with China now is morally fraught. Um, and, um, and I think the Kaduris are trying to navigate the tightrope the same way many other Western companies are. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the reaction to your book has been from um, the families and, um, and, uh, and readers? Yeah, no, it's been, it's been quite striking. I mean, one of the things that I found so interesting, I mean, the book's done quite well in the US, but it's also being published around the world now. Um, it was published in Britain. There are versions coming out in Italy, South Korea, Vietnam. Um, it's kind of amazing. Most amazing is that it's being translated into Chinese and will be coming out uh, in mainland China, which given the state of US-China relations, I found kind of surprising. 
Um, but I think it's a sign that even in China, they want to understand this history and, and how complex it is. Um, so the family reaction was interesting. You know, as a journalist, you typically don't show your stories to people you write about. Um, but in this case, because I was writing about these families, I felt I had to share it with them because I didn't want to make any mistakes. But I wrote to both families and I said, you know, this is the manuscript. I'd like any corrections um, that you can suggest, um, but uh, remember that the interpretation is mine and, and so forth. And the Sassoons, who are quite prominent in Britain, are used to being in the public eye. And so uh, Lord Sassoon, who's the head of the family now, you know, wrote back a very nice and thoughtful letter, added some information, corrected a few things, and then said, you know, as you say, interpretations may differ, but I wish you the best of luck. And I've since gotten a number of calls and letters from members of the Sassoon family who said they didn't know a lot of these things. The Kaduris, I think, had never really been as public. Um, and so um, they were nervous. Um, and I think especially now with what's going on in China. Um, but, you know, I, I think in the end, they, they've been very supportive. The book's a bestseller in Hong Kong. So I think it's bringing them a lot of attention. Um, but they've been very gracious about it. And I think in part because, you know, this is a history that wasn't really known before. And I think it does take both families and kind of places them in, in global history, Chinese history, and Jewish history in, in a way that's, you know, very important. Um, let's get one more question. Um, what was the biggest surprise? What was the um, thing that you really found unexpected? I, I guess there were two things. One was the role of women. I, I think that was something I hadn't thought I would find. And the ability to find a diary kept by Laura Kaduri to kind of put together the story of Flora Sassoon. There's another woman I write about a member of the Sassoon family who became a very prominent newspaper editor in London. Um, you know, women are, have been kind of written out of that history. It's very hard to track down. And so I think recovering that was really, was really important. Um, the other thing I think was that how much these families were like us, right? I mean, they're a lot richer than any of us will ever be, but you wouldn't be surprised to find either the Kaduris or the Sassoons you know, attending this program or in our congregations or visiting the Vilna Shoal or, or vacationing in some grand house on Cape Cod. Um, they were part of the world. And I think so much of Jewish history is often about, you know, great scholars or great rabbis, or it's about the Holocaust. Um, this book is really about families that found themselves in these extraordinary moral situations. You know, do you flee Baghdad or not? Do you participate in the opium trade or not? Do you, you know, recognize the refugee crisis? Do you deal with the Japanese? Do you deal with China today? And I guess I found that very resonant because, you know, 50 years from now or 100 years from now, people are going to be writing histories about all of us. And, you know, we'll be making judgments too about when we were faced with a moral crisis, how did we respond? You know, how did we use our power in business or academics or culture, you know, what did we do? And so I, I found that in a way I could connect with these families more. And the other thing was they were families, you know? I mean, this is about China, it's about Jews, it's about economics, but it's about families and seeing the way brothers related with each other, the way a mother's death affected a family, the way fathers tried to keep control of a global empire through their sons. Um, that was something I think all of us as parents and grandparents can recognize some of those struggles, even if you're really wealthy, are, are struggles that, that we all have. Thank you so much, Jonathan. So this has been, this story is remarkable and it's really been fascinating to hear the, the details. So thank you so much. Thanks, I'm going man. to turn it over to Pamela so she will close for us today. Friends, don't hit that leave button yet. We have some important thank yous and information about upcoming events. I'm Pamela Rothstein. I serve as Director of Lifelong Learning at Falmouth Jewish Congregation, Reform Congregation on Cape Cod. And if you're coming this way, come and visit us. Actually, I don't know if we'll be in person or not, but uh, we, we gather virtually, if not in person.
So this is our final three partnered um, event. We have been so fortunate to be running these programs together. It increases our numbers. It gets you together with great authors and with, with each other. But uh, we have one more uh, Jewish Book Council talk coming up on June 1st, on Tuesday at three o'clock. And then we will be uh, busy very soon planning next year. So stay tuned for future programs and collaborations. But first on Tuesday, June 1st at three, Mimi LeMay, and that's only Worcester and Worcester JCC and Falmouth Jewish Congregation because the Vilna Shul has already hosted Mimi LeMay, but everybody is welcome to that. Um, you can register at falmouthjewish.org. Mimi's book is What We Will Become, A Mother, A Son, and a Journey of Transformation, declared a must-read title by the Massachusetts Book Awards. Kirkus writes, compassionate, wise, and sensitively told, LeMay's narrative offers moving portraits of a mother and father willing to embrace radical change in order to unconditionally support their child, an intimate and clearly heartfelt memoir. This is a story of parenting a transgender child, has excellent reviews. She's a powerful speaker, a topic that we should all be informed about and sensitive to, scheduled during Pride Month. So again, we are all excited about learning more, opening on having these authors uncover lesser known chapters and unknown chapters in Jewish history and world history and uh, the way that Jews inter interact with each other and in the world. So thank you again, hundreds of you for attending today. Come to future events. Thank you, Jonathan Kaufman, so much for this informative, engaging uh, talk. And please uh, go to a cousin's bookstore for copies with book plates or to your local independent store or purchase online a copy of this book. There's so much more in it so many uh, more details and uh, goodbye and thank you everyone. Enjoy the afternoon.